continuing through Paul's epistles in Ephesians chapter 2. Um, it's two weeks ago we covered the first part of chapter 2. And there's really a contrast that's set up in Ephesians here between how your life is in the flesh now and how where you are in spiritual places and that the power is within you, it's Christ within you uh, in order to live out how you are in, in spiritual places. And that's what Paul is getting at here. In chapter 1 verse 3 he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. So we already have the spiritual blessings. And you go over to chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. And so the idea there is that here you were, your spirit was dead, you had no communion with God, you were lost from God, and then when you trusted in the blood of Christ to save you, you were atoned, you were blessed with the spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and now the idea is to get you to uh, live out your life on earth like you are who you are in Christ. In verses 2 and 3 of chapter 2, he starts off verse 2, says, Where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. And he goes through that in verses 2 and 3. And then in verse 4 he says, But God, who is rich in mercy, in verse 6, hath raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So there's that contrast. You were dead in your sins, your spirit, no, no capacity within you, to really serve God at all. But now you've been saved, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, as chapter 1 verse 13 says, you've been blessed with the spiritual blessings in heavenly places, you are raised with Christ. And so now it's really, a, as I titled the message, they're walking in God's works by grace. Uh, you didn't get saved by anything you did, and you don't walk in God's, in God, you don't serve God by anything you did either. It's all by God's grace. And so, uh, in verse 7, uh, that's where we start there, it says, verse 6, we were already raised together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7 says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Uh, basically, your first fill in the blank is the ages to come are when our bodies join the party. The ages to come or when our bodies join the party and meaning you know the party meaning that when you look back in chapter 1 and verse 3 where we saw we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ and we have the capacity to allow Christ to work through us so that we <coughs> live out that our conversation is in heaven and we can put to death the things of the flesh and walk in the spirit we have we're able to do that uh, but really we're still in our old flesh and we still have the problems of that and so it's not you don't really see the full realization of being in Christ and walking in the Spirit until verse 10 there chapter 1 verse 10 that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him so we have the even though we have the capacity to live out allow God to work through us in this life right now uh, because we are still in our vile flesh as Philippians 3 verse 20 calls it uh, we still even though even though we learn the doctrine and read God's Word on a daily basis we're still gonna sin on a daily basis uh, as we get more of the doctrine in it then it transforms us uh, you know Romans 12 talks about that be transformed by the renewing of your mind you let the doctrine get in it transforms your mind and then you're naturally going to serve Christ more and more as the time goes on. But there's still the, it's not until the dispensation of the fullness of times where you have that realization where you've got your uh, the rapture takes place. You've got your glorified new body, and it and it joins with your spirit and soul, and it's all perfect and complete in Christ. And that's why I say. We're already blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We're already seated in Christ Jesus at the Father's right hand. Uh, we already have the, the power through Christ working through us to live for God. But it's not until the ages to come that when our bodies finally get with the program, our old 
vile flesh is transformed into a glorious, glorified new body. Uh, so that's why chapter 2, verse 7 says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches. So right now, verse 6, we're raised up and seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's now. That's how God sees us. But it's not until the ages to come that we see God's grace working through us um, completely without sin uh, because our bodies have not been transformed yet. And so I wrote on your outline here, uh, with the cross, Jesus exposed Satan's powerlessness. That's from Colossians chapter 2. And with the rapture, Jesus shows his full power in that transforming the vile bodies into new glorified bodies. Uh, in the meantime, though, in the now part, it, I put now God's power only comes through the real, and the fill in the blank there is the real crackpots. And that's from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So if we go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, really just in, those, in that little paragraph, those three lines that I put on your outline, uh, you see past, present, future for us. I mean, we've got the outline up here, you know, in time past, but now, ages to come. And we understand, you know, time past related to Israel, their program, but now God starts a dispensation of grace, ages to come. Uh, God focuses on Israel again, and of course, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, both body of Christ and the bride of Christ are in Christ and uh, forever. But at the same time, there is a time past, but now, and ages to come for us uh, in, within the body of Christ. We've got the, Paul talked about in Ephesians 2, 2, time past being before you were saved. The but now is when you're saved, and then the ages to come there is when you've got your glorified body and you're in the kingdom forever. Uh, so you've got the, the, but, the uh, time past, but now, and ages to come there. And we can see that as far as our walk in Christ. Uh, before we were saved, uh, we were following the course of this world, according to Ephesians 2.2. But now we have been saved. We have, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings. We have the capacity to live for Christ. And in the future, we'll do it all the time. But right now, though, God's power only comes through those who allow it to come through. And that's over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And if we start in verse 3 here, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So they're in darkness. They don't have God in them at all because they haven't believed. And then verse 5, it says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. And in verse 6, it's talking about believers, people who have believed the gospel. It says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That face of Jesus Christ is when we come face to face with God's word here in Paul's epistles. And so the light of, of God really is the light of his word. And it's now, we were in darkness, in time past we were in darkness, we believe now. And so the light comes within us as far as we have the mind of Christ, we have the Holy Spirit within us. And then, um, then as far as it being manifested through our bodies, through our flesh, then that's up to us. Are we going to read and believe the doctrine? Then it will be manifested. If we don't, then it's not going to be. And that's what Paul's point is starting in verse 7. He says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So you may think, we understand that, okay, our spirits are alive, the inner man's changed, we're, we're, um, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Well, why doesn't God do that with our flesh, too? Why doesn't He change our flesh, make it a new glorified flesh, and then we serve God all the time after we're saved? And the reason is found here in verse 7. He puts this treasure not in heavenly glorified bodies, but in earthen vessels, things of the earth, things that are, are corrupted, the, the flesh there, so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Because people, especially if they're unsaved, they're looking at things after the flesh. That's all they're concentrated on. 
And so if they're looking at the flesh and our bodies are just these glorified new bodies and we don't sin, you know, in this present world, well, then, then that, that becomes a pride issue for us. I mean, you look at religion and we went over it in the conference about how there's so much pride among the different denominations in religion. And that's, you know, look at how bad, we, I mean, we sin every day. And there's all this pride and thinking we're somehow better than somebody else if we practice this religion or that we can somehow serve God in our flesh. Uh, that's the condition of Christianity as a whole today, even though we have the vile flesh. Well, just think of how much worse it would be if we had the glorified bodies already, because then we would be perfect. And then it would all be about a pride issue. It would be about, you know, look at me, look at how great I am. And that's not the issue. The issue isn't the transforming power of a human being to transform. It's not us. The power is of God. And so God keeps us in these same corruptible earthen vessels so that when people do see a difference, it's not looking at the flesh. They see, they'll say, well, that person looks just like they did 10 years ago, but something's different about them. What's the difference? And then they discover it's God working through them. And so it says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And then the way that God gets us to stop our focus on our earthen vessels and allow the Holy Spirit to work through them is through trials that come our way. And that's why he says in verse 8, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. So that's all the persecutions, trials, tribulations that come our way. And the reason, the last part there of verse 10, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. So the point there is, <coughs> now we have that choice, after we're saved, to allow the Holy Spirit to work through us so that God's power is seen through us. And the only way that happens God's, the fill in the blank there, God's power only comes through the real crackpots. If we glory, glory in our own flesh and we think, you know, we can serve God on our own and we're doing a good job now that we're saved, then it's our pride and it's what we do. And that's what people see. They don't see God's power because we're, we're hiding it. But if we recognize that the flesh is weak and we set it aside... And it comes through these cracks in our flesh, so to speak, the trouble on every side, the distress, the perplexed. Then us, we're going to have that attitude that we're not going to serve God out of the flesh, but we're going to allow God to work through us, let the doctrine work through us. Then it, He's coming through, shining through the cracks in our earthen vessels. Uh, so if we go back to Ephesians chapter 2 now. So in ages to come, according to verse 7, that's where he does show the exceeding riches of his grace. And it's going to, we will serve God without, without sin during that time. But now it's uh, up to us as to what choice we're going to make. Now in verse 8 and 9, this is probably the most popular two verses in all of Ephesians. A lot of people have this memorized. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And, and I asked this question on here on the outline, what is the it in this verse? In verse 8, where it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So I wanted you to think about that. What, what do you think the it is? Um, could it be grace? Is that the gift of God? Uh, is it salvation? Is that the gift of God, or is it faith? Um, all three there seem to be mentioned in the verse. Uh, maybe it's something else. Um, any ideas on that? What you guys think the it is? EC is smiling over here. He's got an answer. <laughs> I don't know. It depends on who you are. <laughs> yeah. If you are Calvin, it should be faith. Okay. But I believe it's salvation. Okay. Any other thoughts on what it is? That's what I would think it was I think a lot of people, most, like you say, Calvinists will say faith. I think most people say 
it's uh, salvation. And like over, if you go over to Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, Ephesians 2 verse 8 is talking about the gift of God. And Romans 6.23 tells you about a gift of God here. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, um, definitely salvation is a gift of God. We learn that from that verse. And so I think a lot of people... Look at Ephesians 2.8 and say it is, salvation is the gift. Um, what I'd like you to consider and what I think it is, and I've just changed my view on this this week. Um, I always thought of it as salvation, but in the context, I think it's faith. Not in a Calvinistic way, not, not that, not a predestination, I'm not talking about that. Um, but let me show you the verses, and again, the fill in the blank that I have is I believe it is faith, but this is all, you know, you fill in what you want there. Um, and let me show you where, where I get that from. If you look in Romans chapter 12, and let's look at Romans 10 first. Let's look at that one, then we'll go to Romans 12. Uh, Romans 10 verse 17 Romans 10 verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Um, so, you know, by, you believe God's word, you hear God's word, you believe it, and then faith comes there. And then in chapter 12 and verse 1, uh, I believe the context of Romans 12 is similar to what we have in Ephesians 2. Uh, Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Um, so what, what I take out of these verses is that when you hear, as, you know, as Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As you hear the word of God and believe it, then I think that's when faith comes. And it's not your faith in this, but it's really Christ's faith. Yes, sir. I have a question on that. What did you just talk when he, he dealt every man in his measure of faith. Yes. Does that mean all of us have a different measure of faith? I, I believe it does. I, I think it's I think what it's talking about, the measure of faith, I believe. Well, some people are easily have more faith. Some that just they have it but it's hard to, to Well some Well I think what what the Christian community as a whole thinks of faith and what is talked about here I think are two different things I, I think the idea is like if you know you grew up Pentecostal I grew up Pentecostal there was this idea in there that God would heal people today and we would bring somebody up in front of the church and put hands on them, anoint them with oil put hands on them, pray for them and pray for God to heal them and there is this idea that um, you know, sometimes they get healed sometimes they don't and if they don't get healed the idea is well they just didn't have enough faith and they go back to the book of Matthew where it says, if you had the faith of the grain of mustard seed, you could move mountains. And so I think what, what the Christian community as a whole, when you say faith or measure of faith, or like you say, some people seem to have more faith than others and some have less, I think that has their thinking more of a, of a belief in that something is going to happen. And I don't think that's what Scripture is talking about. When you look at Scripture, a lot of times when faith is referenced, especially in Paul's epistles, it usually says the faith of Christ. It's Christ's faith. And, you know, if you look, let's say back in uh, Romans chapter 3,
get the dude to handle snakes. I ain't get that right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have I well, I, going to well, it's it's in Mark 16. It's not for our dispensation. That that's the thing. Yeah, if you if you did that today, but, you. But they have faith that God, you know, that's, that's what they're getting at. Go ahead. Well, well, the with that, you know, it's interesting that same, that verse talks about if you if you touch deadly thing, it won't hurt you. It also says if you don't if you drink something deadly, it won't hurt you. So you'll have these snake handlers out there, but you don't have anybody. You don't have a group of people who get together and just drink Drano. Yeah, because the thing is when it comes to handling, if you know, if you've got a deadly poisonous snake, uh, there are people, you'll have them in, in zoos, you know, and you have people who know how to handle the snakes and they have, they never harm them. A lot of times those snakes, even if they're poisonous, they won't bite you unless they're threatened. And like, one, the, I encountered a rattlesnake hiking in the Grand Canyon. And it, it had the rattle, and it gave it, it, when I went by it, I didn't know it was there, I'm just walking on the trail. When I went by it, it sounded so loud, it sounded like a, a jet engine. It, the hiss of that snake was just incredibly loud. And then it just hissed and it went off back in the mountain. That snake didn't want to hurt me. It sees me and says, he's much bigger than me, he could kill me, I'm not going to touch that guy. But it felt threatened, so it hisses at me, tries to get me to leave it alone and then it runs away and so with you know snakes you've got that variable there you can you've got people who know how to handle poisonous snakes and if you're not afraid of them then they're probably not going to attack you and so you've got these churches they can do this snake handling and they handle these poisonous snakes it's not really the power of God it's just them knowing how to handle it or not being afraid of it or, or this snake isn't that aggressive it's not going to try to bite it because it realizes it's a lot smaller than the person you know there are all these factors in other words if i wanted to prove that i had faith that can move mountains i want to prove that god was working through me in that way and i said this verse here is true i can handle deadly snakes and it won't hurt me i wouldn't take that part of the verse i wouldn't try to prove god's faith by handling a deadly snake because there are all these variables there are people who are atheists who could handle a, a deadly snake and it wouldn't hurt them because they know how to do it. But if I'm going to drink Drano, you know, th that's a different story. That's poison. If I drink that, I die. B bottom line. It doesn't matter how the Drano is feeling. It doesn't matter, you know, if it's got the right chemicals in there that is going to poison my body, I will die. So if, you know, if I believe in Mark 16 that if I, if I can handle these snakes and it won't hurt me, if I'm going to believe that part of the verse, I need to believe the other part of the verse that says, if I drink a deadly thing, it won't hurt me. So if I really want to show God's power, I'm going to drink the drain. I'm not going to handle the snakes. Because the snakes people can explain that away. They can say, oh, that's not God's power. That's something else. But if it's truly God's power working through me, I give me a couple of bottles of Drano, get a chemist to test it, show beyond a, a doubt that this is poison, and I drink it and I don't die. Well, that shows that's being fulfilled. But you don't see that today. You see the snakes, you don't see the Drano. And the point I'm making is that's because God's not working like He did in Mark 16. Um, well, He so. also, when it says measure of faith, mm -hmm. um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but some churches um, and some people believe, they have kind of like the, the Peter mentality. You've got some Christians that if Jesus was out in, in a boat, they would go walking on water, you know, to go see him. And, and then when they look down, you know, they look, then they sink into the water. You know, once they realize the, you know, the sea is raging and everything. Mm -hmm. And I think he was wanting to know, is there different measurements of faith? You know, Peter had it several times. You know, he saw Jesus and just went, Shh out there started walking on water and then all of a sudden he looks down and it's like you know did he did his faith leave him once he looked down and he sinks into the water is that today is there a measurement of faith is that what you're asking that's what i'm trying to say yeah. okay um yeah well peter you know that's it have faith to stink i mean you know, yeah. what i'm saying is does it literally mean that when it's, it's saying that you were given uh Measurement of yeah. faith. Mm -hmm. Well, I believe now you have the full measure. It's just how much of it you get. Right. 
Yeah, that's what I'm about to get at. Yeah. So basically, I, God it gives you. Yeah. Well, when you look at how well, much, mm -hmm. okay, in your page in chapter four. I believe this is a full measure that we have. We have the full measure now once Paul completes his epistles. We got the full measure. How much uh, understanding of it depends on how we study it. In verse 13 he says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Once this was completed, when he, when he completed his epistles, we have the full measure right here in this book. Now how much of it we got depends on how how much understanding